For Moses wrote of me, reflections from having lived at Mount Sinai. Father Justin, St. Catherine's Monastery. Sinai is a harsh desert of precipitous granite mountains and narrow rock-strewn valleys. In the scriptures, it is called the waste howling wilderness. Water is scarce and few plants manage to survive. In this severe and barren land, it becomes difficult to sustain life. And yet, it was here that hermits and anchorites came in the latter third and early fourth centuries, searching for places of solitude where they might pass their lives in prayer and fasting. But Sinai is more than a harsh desert, for it was here that God revealed himself in a special way to the prophet Moses, first at the bush that burned with fire without being consumed, and then at the peak of Sinai, where he received the tablets of the law. Here also God revealed himself to the prophet Elias, not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but in a still small voice. Or as it says in the Greek of the Septuagint, phoni avras leptis, the voice of a gentle breeze. When Egeria visited the site around the year 383, she witnessed a flourishing monastic presence and was herself even then following an established pilgrim route. She attended services at the chapel on the summit of Mount Sinai, at the chapel of the prophet Elias a short distance below the summit, and at the chapel of the burning bush in the oasis at the foot of the mountain. The monks celebrated the liturgy for the pilgrims and brought them fruits from their own gardens. At each place, Egeria was diligent to read the appropriate passage from the scriptures. In the middle of the sixth century, the Emperor Justinian ordered the construction of a basilica and high surrounding walls at the traditional site of the burning bush. The walls and the church have stood ever since. The roof beams of the basilica, the trusses, and even the purlins are intact from that time. The eighth beam from the back bears the inscription, Iper Soterias tu Evsavestatu Imon Vasileos Justinianu, for the salvation of our most pious emperor Justinian. The inscription was carved when he was still living. It would predate the year 565. To be at Sinai is to step back into a world that has survived largely intact from late antiquity, and that not just in its fortress walls and church edifices, but in the living monastic community, which can trace an unbroken continuity extending back to the latter third and early fourth century. The first service begins at four o'clock in the morning when the stars are still bright in the clear desert sky. The church is lit by a few lamps and candles as we begin the complex yet familiar cycle of psalms, hymns, and prayers. Some three hours later, the sunlight comes streaming into the sanctuary, illuminating the sixth century mosaic. At the left, just below the roof beams, is a depiction of Moses at the burning bush. At the right, he is depicted receiving the law from the hand of God. In the apse, high above the holy table, Christ is transfigured in glory. Moses and Elias appear speaking with him. The hymns and prayers of our long services are filled with references to the Exodus. These resonate here with a special significance. As a child, I read the story of Moses in the Bible, and not just any Bible, but in the King James Version. I read all about Nops and Takis and Habergians. It was a magical world. If it is increasingly rare to find young people today who read the King James Bible, certainly we all know the story of how Moses delivered his people from bondage. The account of the Exodus begins in the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. Moses commanded the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of the first month, 
they should take an unblemished male lamb of the first year, one for each household. On the evening of the fourteenth day, they were to kill it and strike its blood on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house. They were to eat its flesh, roast with fire, together with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, ready to depart from Egypt. That night, the Lord smote the firstborn of all the Egyptians, but passed over the houses that had been sealed with the blood of the Lamb. The children of Israel departed from the land of Egypt in all their multitude, together with their flocks and herds. The sea opened before them, and the returning waters covered the pursuing host of Pharaoh. They ate manna that came down from heaven and drank water that came forth from the rock. Moses brought them to Mount Sinai, where God had first appeared to him. At the peak of Sinai, Moses received the Ten Commandments and the whole inspiration of the law. There also he beheld in sacred vision the pattern of the tabernacle. In the Exodus, the Lord revealed himself as the living God who had chosen Israel to be his people. It was in the crucible of Sinai that Israel became a nation. The annual celebration of the Passover was a commemoration of these wondrous deeds and the confident expectation that God would again visit his people as he had of old. After a wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, Moses was taken from them. Then God said to Joshua, Jesus of Navi, as he is called in the Greek of the Septuagint, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. When they came to the river Jordan, the waters parted before them, even as the Red Sea had parted before them at the time of Moses. This also happened at the same time of year as the exodus from Egypt, for the crossing of the Jordan took place on the 10th day of the first month, and on the 14th they kept the Pascha, the Passover. The crossing of the River Jordan is thus seen as a new exodus. When they were encamped at Gilgal, an angel appeared to Jesus of Navi and said, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. These are the words that Moses heard at the burning bush on Sinai. Jesus of Navi led the children of Israel into the promised land, and it is written that the people feared him even as they had feared Moses. In all of this, he is thus seen as a new Moses. An appeal is made to the earlier Exodus and to Moses as a way of illuminating the significance of the new Exodus and the new leader, Jesus of Navi. The new Exodus and the new leader take on a special significance precisely because of this correlation. There are many such patterns that could be identified in the Holy Scriptures. The earlier event, person, or place is said to be a type of the later event, person, or place from the Greek word typos, meaning prototype, pattern, or figure. When two events are thus correlated, it is said that a typology is established between them. The later event will never be precisely identical with the earlier to which the appeal is made, but the correlation is sought as a way of adapting or interpreting the present experience by means of the older event, person, or place, and thus celebrating the new event and revealing the providential continuity in the historical experience. Typologies do not always link earlier events with present experience. The prophets of Israel also invoke these same correlations in speaking of future hopes. The prophet Hosea recalled the sojourn in the wilderness with longing it had been a time when God was close to his people. Again, God would bring Israel into the wilderness where the covenantal alliance would be re-consecrated as in the days of her youth 
and as in the day when she came up out to the land of Egypt. The prophet Micah writes that God will again show marvelous things according to the days of their coming out of the land of Egypt. These typologies with the search and culmination in the prophecies of Isaiah. The return from the captivity of Babylon to Zion is seen as a new exodus, and the first is invoked for the mighty acts of God that took place at that time. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing, declare ye, tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob, and they thirsted not. When he led them through the deserts, he caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He clave the rock also, and the waters gushed out. In eschatological vision, the prophet Isaiah also sees the conversion of the nations who will be a part of this new exodus to Zion, and there the establishment of a universal messianic kingdom. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. Through it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out to the land of Egypt. Art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and shall come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. When the children of Israel compass the land of Edom, they were bitten by fiery serpents and many died. God commanded Moses to make a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. Those who looked to the brazen serpent were healed and lived. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. In making this correlation, Jesus was establishing a typology between himself and the serpent in the wilderness. He was doing what Israel had always done, interpreting the present in light of the past, invoking the past to provide insight into the present. The serpent lifted up in the wilderness brought healing to all who looked to it. It would be the same with himself. But how should we understand the expression, son of man? In Psalm 8, it means man weak and insignificant, but destined for greatness. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. In this way, Jesus could indicate his identification with all mankind, especially the weak and humble. In Psalm 80, the title denotes Israel made strong out of weakness. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand and upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. The prophet Daniel beheld a vision of four beasts symbolizing four successive kingdoms. Then one, like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and to him was entrusted an everlasting dominion. Here the Son of Man is a bearer of God's judgment and kingdom. He is emblematic of the saints of the Most High, who, humbled for a season, shall inherit glory, and honor. Isaiah had prophesied about a servant of the Lord 
whose vicarious suffering and death would bring the nations to the knowledge of God. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The servant of the Lord is Israel, or Jacob. But in other texts, the servant is a prophetic figure with a mission to Israel, and these two senses alternate or intermingle. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. These were ominous words and would have been remembered, but their meaning remained hidden. At Caesarea Philippi, Simon Peter confessed Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus immediately revealed the further mystery that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. But these words fell on uncomprehending ears. St. Luke shows us how they came to understand what before had been concealed from them. On the road to Emmaus, Luke and Cleopas relate how they had trusted that Jesus would have redeemed Israel but instead he had been condemned to death and crucified. Their every hope had died with him. That very morning, certain women had been to the sepulcher, which they had found empty, and had seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. But these reports only added to their bewilderment. The stranger who had been traveling with them suddenly interrupted, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In the breaking of the bread, they recognized the risen Christ and travel all through the night back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples their sorrow and confusion now turn to joy and wonder. The preaching of the apostles was that in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the scriptures had been fulfilled. This appeal to the scriptures was not something added at a later date. It was an inherent part of the earliest preaching. George Caird has expressed this well. In doing justice to the spontaneity of their faith, we must not assume that the members of the Jerusalem community were simple reporters of facts who took no time to reflect on the significance of the experience they described. A full heart does not necessarily mean an empty mind. The first disciples would never have begun to preach at all unless they had believed that their experience was of universal significance, unless they had seen the events of the gospel story against a background of interpretation. The preaching of St. Peter on the day of Pentecost was that Jesus' passion and crucifixion had been by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And he invoked the verse from the Psalms, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The eunuch of Queen Candace was reading from the prophet Isaiah. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch asked, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. The eunuch accepted baptism and went on his way rejoicing. In Matthew 12:17, we read, 
that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet. The following four verses are a quotation of Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Before the Septuagint had translated the passage, O ekpektosmo, prosedexato avton ipsichimo, my chosen, my soul, hath accepted him. In Matthew, the words have been translated, O agapitosmo, is on evdokisan ipsichimo, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. At the baptism of Christ and at the transfiguration, the voice from heaven declares, Utos estin o yosmo o agapitos en o evdokisa. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. These are the words of the prophet Isaiah and identified Jesus as the servant whom he foretold. But the Gospel of St. Matthew, Matthew 24, 30, and the book of Revelation, Revelation 1, 7, describe the parousia of Christ using a combination of phrases from Daniel 7, 13 and Zechariah 12, 10 through 13, 1. Psalms 110 and 8 are found in conjunction in 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 28, in the first two chapters of the Epistle of the Hebrews, and in 1 Peter 3, 22. These are only a few examples of many that might be given. The hypothesis of literary interdependence is attended with difficulty. The simplest explanation for the shared Old Testament exegesis is that it goes back to the heart of the original primitive gospel. That we find all of the writers of the New Testament following the same exegesis is evidence that it extends to the earliest period of church history to which we can gain access. It is to this that St. Paul himself appeals in his first epistle to the Corinthians, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The conversion of St. Paul is generally dated to three years after the crucifixion. When he writes about the faith that he himself received and that he delivered to others, it takes us back to the earliest years of Christianity. This method of scriptural interpretation is presupposed in our earliest sources. Moreover, we can say that this method of interpretation had its origin in Jesus himself, who found in the scriptures the delineation of his own ministry and taught his disciples to understand the scriptures in the same way. But the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus was more than the fulfillment of isolated proof texts. The resurrection of Christ is the resurrection of Israel, of which this prophet spoke. The experience of Christ is the recapitulation of the experience of the people of God. He had been raised as the firstborn from the dead. The first fruits would be followed by the great in gathering. The Apostle Paul writes of Christ as the second Adam. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And he continues, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory, referencing Isaiah 25, 8. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Referencing Hosea 13, 14. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, 
for he wrote of me. We want to know where, how. St. John Chrysostom, in his homilies in the Gospel of John, said that the scriptures testified of him, he declared, but where they testify, he added not, desiring to inspire them with greater awe and to prompt them to search and to reduce them to the necessity of questioning. But then neither does St. John answer our question, but immediately moves on to the next verse. St. Cyril of Alexandria wrote a commentary on the gospel according to St. John, in which he said, Moses hath through many forms fortified the mystery of Christ. For so as not to heap up a great multitude of examples, he will limit himself to one. And he quotes a verse from Deuteronomy where God says to Moses, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. The Apostle Peter invokes this same verse in reference to Jesus in the third chapter of Acts. This is true, but it does not get us very far. We have already seen one answer to our question. Jesus saw himself prefigured in the brazen serpent that Moses raised up in the wilderness. All who looked to it were healed and lived. It would be the same with himself a dark reference, as we know, to the crucifixion. Here, Jesus himself would have said, for he wrote of me. Are there other answers to our question within the New Testament itself? All three synopsis have an account of the transfiguration of Christ. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. Moses and Elias appeared speaking with Jesus, but only Luke tells us the subject of their conversation. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Eleguan din exodon aptu in emelen Pliron and Jerusalem. This could be translated literally, and spake of his exodus, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. The Greek word the Saint Luke uses, exodus, is very unusual word for decease, death. Yet it allowed the evangelist to speak of Jesus' decease using a word that brought with it Old Testament associations of divine deliverance. To quote George Caird once again, the exodus in which God had brought his people through slavery to freedom, had made them a nation, had bound them to himself by a gracious covenant, and had provided the basic pattern for the interpretation of Israel's subsequent history. The Lord their God, who had brought them out of Egypt, would redeem them from every other humiliation, deserved or undeserved, and bring them in the end through the cleansing fires of affliction to their destined glory. This faith was kept alive by the annual memorial service of the Passover, which looked back to the historic emancipation and forward to God's future reign of righteousness and peace, and spake of his exodus, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. When Jesus held the Passover with his disciples, he said, with desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus spoke of his impending death is a baptism, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? At Jerusalem, 
In his passion, crucifixion, and resurrection, Jesus fulfilled the Passover and the Exodus, leading God's people from captivity into the promised land of the kingdom, bringing to completion the great plan of deliverance and redemption of which the whole story of the Old Testament was a prophetic forecast. In the first epistle to the Corinthians, written around the year 54, St. Paul was able to appeal to the Exodus and the sojourn in the wilderness as a paradigm of the Christian life. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. And he says, Now these things were our examples, or literally types. The passage through the Red Sea was a pattern, a type of Christian baptism by which we are delivered from captivity. The spiritual meat and spiritual drink that sustain them are patterns, types of the Christian Eucharist, Eucharistia, the thanksgiving that we offer. It follows that the sojourn in the wilderness becomes a pattern, a type of the Christian life, with times of trial and times of consolation, God guiding us through both unto the promised land. But the most sustained meditation on the significance of the crucifixion expressed in the mosaic imagery of sacrifice and tabernacle is found in the epistle to the Hebrews. At the peak of Sinai, God revealed the tabernacle to Moses in sacred vision. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I shew thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. The tabernacle had an outer boundary. Within this enclosure, animals were sacrificed and offerings were made for forgiveness of sins and for the blessing of God's people. An inner sanctuary contained the golden lampstand with seven oil lamps and the table of the shewbread. This led to the Holy of Holies, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with gold with the two cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Into this sanctuary, the high priest entered once every year. Jesus has become our high priest, not after the order of the Levitical priesthood, but according to the order of Melchizedek, the priest and king who blessed Abraham. Jesus had no need to offer up daily sacrifices for his own sins and then for the people's, entering into the true tabernacle in the heavens, of which the earthly tabernacle was a foreshadowing, he offered himself as a blameless sacrifice once and for all. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. We have such an high priest who is sat on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Through him, believers receive a kingdom that endures forever. For Moses wrote of me, Jesus appealed to the brazen serpent as a type, a prefiguration of the cross. The apostle Peter quoted the verse that God would raise up a prophet like unto Moses as having been fulfilled in Christ. These are specific examples for which one could say, for Moses wrote of me. But it was, above all, the entire narrative of the Exodus, the formative story of Israel, that was seen as a type, a prefiguration, 
of what Jesus had accomplished at Jerusalem. The sacrifice of the blameless lamb, deliverance from death through his blood, freedom from captivity, passage through the waters of the sea, triumph over enemies, being sustained by manna that came down from heaven and water that gushed forth from the side of the rock, the approach to the holy mount, God dwelling tangibly in the midst of his people as he leads them to the promised land. These were types of Christ. All of these events were understood as having taken place in anticipation of Christ. Here also, one could say, for Moses wrote of me. This insight is a key to understanding complex Orthodox hymns and early Christian iconography. I will close with one example of each. On the second Sunday before the beginning of Great Lent in the Orthodox Church, commemoration is made of the prodigal son who is set before us as an example of saving repentance. The parable is told in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke. A certain man had two sons. The younger said to his father, the money that I will inherit when you die, I want it now. He took the money and went into a far country and led a party life. The money was gone before he knew it. And then a severe famine set in. What little food there was could only be had at exorbitant prices. He was lucky to find a job feeding pigs. Pigs can be dangerous. Their pens reek. He was feeding them hus, and there was nothing for him to eat. It was then that he came to himself. He thought of home, and remembered that even his father's servants were better off. And he came up with a plan. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Our life lies in this arising. But the father had not forgotten his wicked son. He often looked off into the distance hoping against hope that one day his son would return. And one day he does see him, but can it be him? He is now so thin and gaunt and dressed in rags. Indeed, it is him. At last he is there and the father sweeps him into his embrace. The son cannot even complete his prepared little speech before the father sends his servants to bring the best robe, a ring, and shoes, and orders them to prepare a lavish feast. The father does not stop to drill his son on what happened. Why has he returned? What exactly does he want now? Does he truly regret what happened? What would be the terms under which he might be accepted back, if indeed he is accepted back at all? The son has been prodigal in his wickedness, but the father is even more prodigal in his all-embracing and all-forgiving love. For this is my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. In the concluding hymn of Matins for the Sunday of the prodigal son, we take up his words and his plea. O oh, good father, I have gone afar off from thee. Forsake me not, nor shew me as one unfit for thy kingdom. The wicked enemy hath stripped me and taken my wealth. Like a prodigal have I squandered the graces of my soul. But having risen and returned to thee, I cry out, make me as one of thy hired servants, thou who for my sake did stretch out thine immaculate hands on the cross to snatch me from the dread beast and to clothe me in the first raiment, for thou only art plenteous in mercy. The composer of the hymn does more than recount the parable. 
he creates a typology between the compassionate father and Christ himself. Jesus stretched out his sinless hands upon the cross as the good father welcoming back the prodigal son. He sets us free from the enemy and clothes us with the primordial glory for which we were created, for he alone is plenteous in mercy. The church of St. Clement in Rome preserves the site of the original 4th century church. By the 6th century, it had been richly adorned with carved marble panels. The church had become ruinous by the 11th century. Also, the level of the city had risen some 16 feet in the intervening centuries as buildings fell into ruins and new ones were built over the old. In 1108, a new church was built directly above the earlier church. The 6th century marble panels were installed in the new church in their original configuration. This gives it a sense of great antiquity. The visual focal point of the church is the apse mosaic created in the latter 12th century. In the center is Christ crucified. To his right stands the Virgin Mary, to his love to St. John the Theologian. A depiction of the cross with branches at its base is known as the tree of life. Adam partook of the forbidden tree by his disobedience bringing death upon the world. Through the tree of the cross, Christ the new Adam undid the trespass of the first created and paradise is open to us again. Twelve doves have come and lodged in its branches. These are emblems of the apostles, heralds of peace, and of God's glad tidings. From the cross, verdant acanthus leaves have grown into a great vine with swirling tendrils that fill the entire apse. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Within the vine are beautiful flowers and birds as well as saints and noblemen, and beneath them are scenes from everyday life. A woman feeds grain to her chickens, and a shepherd tends his flock. The inscription below reads, We have likened the church to this vine. Beneath the cross, a deer attacks a serpent, and below, two deer drink from streams of water that flows from the cross. The Physiologus was a text on natural history that was well known in the classical world. In it we read that if a deer living in the desert finds a snake and kills it, it then searches for streams of water to neutralize the poison of the snake. Abba Pimin, who lived in the fourth and fifth centuries, quoted the verse from the Psalms, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God, and explained it by means of the story from the Physiologos. He then made the spiritual interpretation. Monks live in the desert, devoting their lives to prayer and fasting and acts of ascetic struggle. They look forward to Sunday when they gather for the celebration of the liturgy that they might receive communion and so be strengthened in their spiritual dedication. This depiction with the Eucharistic interpretation is directly above the holy table where the liturgy was celebrated. At the base of the apse, we see a lamb with a golden halo flanked by 12 lambs, six to either side. The 12 are emblems of the apostles. And we recall the vision from the Revelation. St. John hears the lion of the tribe of Judah, but when he looks, he sees a lamb as it had been slain for the salvation of the world. Above the apse, Christ is depicted in a medallion, holding the gospel in his left hand, his right hand raised in blessing. To either side of the four living creatures beheld by the prophet Ezekiel, which in the early church were seen as symbols of the evangelists. 
To our left is the Apostle Paul with St. Lawrence, the Archdeacon. To our right is the Apostle Peter with St. Clement, to whom the church is dedicated. Below, on the right, is the prophet Jeremiah, holding a scroll with the words, This is our God, and there shall none other be accounted of in comparison of him. The words are here addressed to Christ. On the left is the prophet Isaiah, holding a scroll with the words, Vivi dominum sedentem super solium. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. These words also are addressed to Christ. The artist has completed a completely startling typology. The prophetic vision of the Lord sitting upon a throne is now fulfilled in Christ crucified upon the cross. This also accounts for the inscription that runs around the perimeter of the apse. The familiar words of the angels at the birth of Christ have been expanded with an important addition. The words now read, Gloria in excelsis Deo sedenti super thronum et in terra pax hominibus bona voluntatis. Glory to God on high, sitting upon a throne, and on earth peace to men of good will. We return to Sinai. When it is my turn to celebrate the Divine Liturgy, after the opening psalms and hymns, I carry the Holy Gospel into the center of the church. I raise it up on high and say, Sophia, or thee. This might be translated, wisdom, stand aright. At that moment, I see above me the silver candelabra and oil lamps that were given to the monastery over the centuries. Above is an immense cross with a depiction of the crucifixion dating from the 18th century. And behind to either side are the panels of the 6th century mosaic. On the left, Moses stands before the burning bush. On the right, he receives the Ten Commandments from the hand of God. The distant mosaic speaks of Passover and Exodus. The icon of Christ above speaks of Eucharist and redemption. With the coming of the kingdom, the world to come has broken in upon the present age. In the celebration of the divine liturgy, the commemoration of past events and the anticipation of the future are united in the present moment. At the four arms of the cross are the symbols of the evangelists, Matthew, the angel, Mark, the lion, Luke, the ox, and John, the eagle. They wrote the gospels that have carried the word of salvation to the four corners of the earth but they are also the four living creatures beheld by the prophet Ezekiel, who supported the throne of God. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Again, we have the prophetic vision of the Lord seated upon a throne, now fulfilled in Christ crucified upon the cross. And I remember a commentary on the verse from the book of Revelation, I, John, your brother, a partner in the ordeal and sovereignty and endurance which are ours in Jesus. He does not think of the suffering of Christ as the prelude to kingly glory. Christ reigns from the cross. So too, for his followers, the coming ordeal is not a qualifying test through which they must pass in order to enter upon their promised reign with Christ. Ordeal and sovereignty or obverse and reverse of the one calling for those who endure with Christ also reign with him and reign in the very midst of their ordeal. 
I enter the Vima and place the gospel upon the holy table. It is the same holy table that was installed in the middle of the sixth century at the command of the emperor Justinian. How many others have stood at this very place in the intervening 1400 years? In the springtime, the rising sun suddenly fills the Vima with light. The sunbeams become palpable in the clouds of incense. Again, I recall a verse from the Revelation. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. The Almighty, the Omnipotent, are translations of the Greek opandokrator, which is itself one of the several Septuagint translations of the Hebrew Lord of Sabbath, Lord of Hosts. St. John uses these Old Testament terms with a difference, for he has learned from Christ that the omnipotence of God is not the power of unlimited coercion, but the power of invincible love. <laughs> 